So the question is, do you believe the Pentecostal church is doing enough to combat becoming too feminine and driving men away? Oh, this is an awesome question. It's a good question. It's, it's got I think Pentecost, I mean, it's got presuppositions here. So um, I just got some pretty accurate presuppositions in it too. Well, in, in your opinion. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we're going to talk about. Do you believe the Pentecostal church is doing enough? So this is, this is, Presupposing that there is a feminization of feminization of worship, of, and, of I the there, church, and I think church, and I think there is. Um, okay, we'll go ahead. Well, let's let's frame this. Do you believe that the Pentecostal Church is doing enough to combat becoming too feminine and driving men away? So it's presupposing that there's a feminization of the church. One, it's also suggesting that. Probably women outnumber the men in our churches, and in most churches, that's that's accurate. And uh, so, the feminization of men, and or their, the feminization of worship culture that repels masculinity. Okay, so I think we just start talking, and I think we'll figure it out. Yeah, I mean, there, there's certainly a tendency toward worship style that's very uh, sentimental and emotional. And like when you have songs in culture that says heaven meets earth like a sloppy wet kiss, mm -hmm. and a lot of the touchy feely style almost replace the word God, and you got a really good love song. Kind wrap me, of wrap me in your arms, wrap me in your arms. That kind of worship. Uh, Brother Urshan has a very interesting uh, rendition of that song. I won't talk about it. <laughs> Anybody that's watching this video, I ask him about his rendition of Nathaniel Urshan. Wrap me in your arms. Go ahead. So a, a, a lot of that type of music tends toward that that language and expression tends toward a, to be emotional, emotionally, romantically uh, driven in terms of its sentiment. And there there have been, and because we're doing this off the top of my head, I, I can't cite the studies, but there have been there have been significant studies done, research done, uh, on why that uh, many men don't feel comfortable in a modern worship context is because there there has been a, a trend toward the feminization of of worship and worship expressions within um, many areas of, of Christianity in the 21st century. So I think I would start culturally. Yeah. And talk about culture. What has culture done over the past uh, 50, 60 years? I think there's certainly a trend culturally of the feminization of men. Period. Period. In the world. Exactly. So with um, with television programming, where when you have a sitcom, if anybody is portrayed as an idiot and a buffoon in a family sitcom, it's going to be the dad. He's always the macho man, etc. Yeah, and or. Uh, the, the, the stupid guy that everybody makes fun of right. that um, right so they marginalize the, the, the influence man of masculine true of masculinity, masculinity. Um, and and I would say and, and the, that's a general statement so but I, I think it, it certainly is is valid um, but but let's talk facts uh, there have been movements uh, the metrosexual movement where it's, yeah. the, it's sort of the Blurring the line between male and female, um, the the metrosexual. Yeah, I think that you know that's a probably an early two thousands term or maybe yeah. even a late nineties term, the metrosexual. Um, but then just talking about uh, the sanctity of marriage, yeah, where culture is now shifting, yeah, and and it's shifting in the in the area of gender, gender, gender blending, distinction, yeah, exactly. And really, right now there is a, a push. Coming from a, a great, a great, a, a vast amount of people trying to shift this idea that uh, of gender neutrality, fluidity, yeah. right? So, 
not only is is uh, feminism uh, making its way into the church, but masculinity is making its way into the church where masculinity doesn't belong. Yeah. So it, it, there's confusion here. It's yeah. chaos. And so to me, the question: Are, are we does, do the Pentecost Church doing enough to combat um, becoming too feminine? Okay, I, I don't know if that's the perfect question. The question is: yeah. Are we doing enough to protect? Uh, biblical Bi- sexual roles, yes. biblical roles biblical of sexuality and, and gender distinction, distinction of genders. You're right. Yeah, and and I I don't know if we are. I, I think we can honestly, do a better job. Yeah, I think we could do a better job of protecting and re- preserving a biblical masculinity mm-hmm. and protecting and preserving a, a, a biblical femininity. Correct. And those two are not in competition with each other, no. which is what the culture falsely assumes. Right. To be masculine is to be anti-female uh, or to be anti-woman. And, and theologically, that's not the case. And in case anybody's wondering, I'm very I'm very pro-women in ministry. Absolutely. And so uh, the idea that I um, think uh, that masculinity, biblical masculinity, needs to be preserved and protected is not to say that uh, I think that the church should be... Uh, uh, controlled by um, men in every particular way and that women do nothing and say nothing because I certainly believe in a very active presence and role of of women within within ministry and within a vibrant and healthy uh, biblical church. Agreed. And, and while I, I think because this is, it says Pentecostal church in the uh, question, it's uh, not a, an exclusively Pentecostal problem. No, it's the, that's the, I don't think it is. No, I think it's in all churches. In fact, there are there are there are denominations, there are denominate Christian denominations that are much more opposed to uh, the role of women within the local congregation than what Pentecostals are. In fact, Pentecostalism has been on the forefront of promoting. Uh, the role of women in ministry because we believe uh, in the Holy Spirit for both male and female, the whole Joel 2, Acts 2, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Mm -hmm. Pentecostals have been at the forefront of promoting uh, the functionality of women within the local church. And when you, when you get into other, uh, when you get into other uh, denominations of Christianity that are high church, more formal, liturgical type of uh, denominations, they don't have nearly the involvement of women uh, in their worship experience as as Pentecostals do. And and Pentecostals, I'm including both Trinitarian and Oneness Pentecostals. Mm-hmm. That Pentecostalism as the big umbrella has done more to to promote female participation in worship than any other segment of Christianity. Yes, agreed. And we could talk a lot about, about a lot of other things there, but I think we sort of covered that question. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. How can the church reconcile showing showing the love of Christ while also taking taking such a hard line stance against homosexuality? A lot of presuppositions here too. Yeah. Well, because it pre it, it I think it has a little bit of a cultural uh, misconception that that love equals acceptance and that some somehow if I don't accept or approve then that's hate right and so it's a, sometimes showing the love of Christ demands that we say to people that a certain behavior is biblically inappropriate if you love me keep my commandments Correct. that that's an aspect of love that the culture does uh, does not acknowledge at all Correct. And so I think the, the balance is, is that showing the love of Christ to the homosexual community um, is that anybody that comes into our congregations, regardless of what their sin of choice is, is that we preach the gospel to it. And we leave it up to that, that particular person, whatever their lifestyle is to either accept or reject the gospel. And so we preach the same gospel to um, 
we preach the same gospel to an adulterer, that we preach to a fornicator, that we preach to uh, someone who is involved in same-sex uh, behaviors. Correct. I think we treat everyone with kindness Absolutely. and love. And we, we do not stoop by using derogatory slang, language slurs or any derogatory language. Yeah. We love like Christ would love. Yes. And as you said, love does not mean acceptance. Mm -hmm. And so I can love you and not accept That's your exactly lifestyle right. or your views. Yes. And I can still treat you with And kindness. not just about homosexuality, about any particular... Any... Any... Anything. Any lifestyle, any... So I think it's very important, one, that the church not have a homophobic attitude. Yeah. Um, in the sense of, of, of pushing people away. Yes. And I think on the other side of the spectrum, that if, if you're a homosexual, um, you should also accept the fact that the church disagrees with your lifestyle. Yeah. And no, it's not in most cases. And no, it's not um, hate. No. Yeah, it's not hate. Because many of us that are in the church have an uncle or a brother or uh, in some cases a, a mom or a dad or somebody in our family that lives uh, a homosexual lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so we love them as family just like we do anybody else. So in most cases, it's not a matter of hate. Technically, a phobia is not a hatred, it's a fear. Right. And so homo, homophobia would be a fear of homosexuality or an irrational, as the dictionary would define it, an ir irrational fear. And so as a, as a Christian church in the 21st century, we are not, this local congregation is not, afraid of having any particular demographic or lifestyle within our community to attend church and to uh, begin a relationship with Christ. Right. You know, the, the only thing that's not tolerated in this era of tolerance is intoleration. <laughs> exactly. Intolerance of anything or yes. anyone or any idea. And, and so we've, we've got to push back from that. And, and people need to, to be mature enough to understand that not everyone's going to agree with you. And I understand as well, and we're not just talking about the homosexual area. Um, some people are not going to agree with teaching on separation from the world, holiness, etc. Yeah. It does not mean that I hate them. No, it does not mean not. that I dismiss them as a no. person. It just means we do disagree in this particular subject. And, and we need to be able to disagree with one another and still have a relationship with one another yeah. and not burn the bridge because I disagreed with one thing you said. Exactly. Right. And, and so, but as a church, we, as, as the church, we do need to have the grace to when someone walks into our congregation that by all appearances is apparently a homosexual to be able to show the grace and the love of God to them to where they can come in to our to our services and hear the gospel without feeling like they are uh, somehow not welcome or we wish they weren't there. Right. Agreed. So I think that answers that as well. Okay. My last one. Should there be limitations on women being in the ministry? Are women preachers okay? Women pastors? Question mark. Um... I am, with, without going into the nuanced arguments, and maybe this is a, a conversation that we can have in an, another episode or another video. The short answer uh, is I'm 100% convinced of uh, the biblical permission for a woman to preach, for a woman to be involved in preaching and even pulpit ministry. Um, I am not 100% percent convinced that the Bible teaches that women can or should pastor, even though uh, I have I have a very good friend of mine, you know him, Jason Weatherly has written a book on women in ministry that he makes a compelling argument for the uh, uh, for the role of women in every aspect of ministry. 
And um, I preached for uh, I preached for women pastors, and one of the greatest Christian women that I know is is a a pastor in Illinois. And so I'm certainly not going to say the Bible prohibits it, but I'm uncertain on the pastoral role, what I think the Bible actually teaches about it. Should there be limitations on women being in ministry? Um, yes and no. Are women preachers okay? Absolutely. Yes. Women pastors, yes. That's my stance on that. Yeah. Um, I certainly don't, I certainly am not going to fight it. And yes. it, it, and I believe that women pastors are okay in the sense that it, it's conditional. And it's, it's relative to the situation. Exactly. And I am actually having a, a woman pastor that I, I actually have a woman pastor scheduled to come preach here at Point of Mercy. Mm-hmm. So that in and of itself says that. So yes. I, I don't believe right. that it's uh, inappropriate or sinful in any way or I wouldn't be having her come to speak at this right. church. So, I mean, that answers, it's yeah. basically an opinion question. Uh, we can get into some great debates or we could take four hours. <laughs> exactly. Getting into this. But but this is a good time. Uh, uh, that, ooh. Not bad? Not bad. Boomerang. Look at that. Dude, perfect, bro. Dude, perfect. That's oh, very do. nice. That's how you do it. So Jason's weather, Jason Weatherly's book um, on women and women in ministry is an excellent um, resource if anybody wants to read a great book on the topic. The name of it? The name of the the name of the book is. In the company. Great was the company of women. Yes, great. Was great was the company of women, yeah. and it's available on Amazon. Uh, excellent read. Okay. Uh, all right. This actually, this actually is connected to an earlier question. Okay. Um, should saints pay tithe on their tithes on their gross or net income, and should tithe uh, saints pay tithes on their businesses income? What? It's two ten in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's two ten in the morning, is what he was saying, um, because she probably wasn't going to be be able to completely understand what he just said. <laughs> okay, so the question is, what again? Should saints pay tithes on their gross or net income, and should saints pay tithes on their businesses income? Uh, I teach to pay tithe on your gross income. Now, if if you would like to play it on your net and then pay. Um, on your on your tax return, turn. Uh, then that's fine uh, with me. Um, I'm going to give God the same courtesy I give the government. I'm going to tithe on what I what I'm taxed on. Exactly, that's that's essentially it. So yeah. whatever my my income is, my gross, that's that's that I'm going to tithe on. Um, the next one should I tithe on my business? Should my business tithe on its profits? Yes. Basically, um, I do. Yeah. I do. If I have a business, um, I tie it on its profits, and that's pretty cut and dry for me. Yeah, I don't really have any much anything else to add. We we sort of talked about this. Yeah, uh, I quite honestly, I don't I don't have a an answer biblically that I feel comfortable even answering the the business portion of well, that the question. money. If assuming. Assuming that increase is coming to you as the business owner, yeah. then you tithe on it. Yeah. I think that's that's the biblical concept there. Yeah. You tithe off your increase. Yeah. So if if now does that mean I tithe every year off my business? Yeah. Well, do I take money out of my business each year? See, see, but that's the question. See, that's what I know. I think I know who asked this. Okay. So the question is, the salary that I take from business revenue. Yes. I'm tithe. going to I'm going to tithe off of right. that. But the uh, the business is going to be making a profit. That money will, much of that money will stay in the business to 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 buy more product, to reinvest in the business itself. That I don't take as that I may not be taking as personal income that will benefit me personally. Correct. There'll be a windfall somewhere. Yeah. If you're a profitable business, yeah. So if you sell the business, tithe yeah. off it. Exactly. Tithe off the profit. Um, it doesn't have to be done every year. Yeah. Um. The one part of the settle for me is whatever monies that I earn 
as income, whether it's preaching or yes. whatever business endeavor that I'm involved in, or if I <coughs> sell an investment, if I make a profit off of it, I'm going to tie it off of the profit. Correct. Exactly. That's it. Got a good one. Right by the camera. That's going to be a pretty cool shot. It wasn't bad at all. <laughs>